Good day to, to everybody. And today we have with Robin Fitzjoy. She's uh, the Middlebury legislator, one of the two. Amy Sheldon is the other one. Right. And um, so uh, we're having a talk today about what she does and what's happening. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, Betty. It's so nice to be back on your show, and I'm really glad you're continuing to do what we all call the Betty Show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you asked me to talk a little bit about the committee I'm on and what, what kinds of things we're doing, and uh, I could probably talk all day about that because it's pretty interesting, but I will... Uh, summarize it's great that we it. have. Summarize it. So I'm on House Corrections and Institutions. Uh, and so uh, we're both a money committee and a policy committee. Uh, and the, uh, the, the policy side is around our correctional facilities, uh, our prison system in the state of Vermont. And so we do a lot of things related to that. And then the uh, institutions part is related to the capital budget. And so it's all the money that the state borrows to do their business. So anytime the state goes out to bond uh, for dollars, it all comes through our committee, which means I pretty much talk to every agency in the state uh, about a wide variety of things. So, yeah. so, yeah. Um, so it's great. I had judiciary. Yes, yeah. and judiciaries had a lot of very interesting things oh, yeah. happening yeah. Um, this year. Every year they do. Yeah. And, so, and, and we often work together, particularly with with regard to corrections, because. Uh, there are a lot of things that, um, for example, uh, bail reform impacts what happens in our correctional facility, and bail reform comes through judiciary. Um, so you have sometimes have uh, committees meeting together on we, an issue? Yeah, we do. Uh, this year we've actually had, uh, we had a joint hearing uh, with House Health Care and Human Services, and corrections uh, around uh, mental health and our correctional facilities. The secretary of the Agency of uh, Human Services, Al Gobey, we, the legislature asked them last year to take a look at the whole mental health system and the correctional facility. They all come under human health and human services. Uh, and because we have, we have a lot of issues and, and backup, particularly in our mental health facilities, um, and most of this is not related to Hurricane Irene. A lot of times people think, well, we lost a lot of beds because when Hurricane Irene, or Tropical Storm Irene, wiped out the state hospital in Waterbury in oh, 2009, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that we don't have as many beds. And in fact, we have the same number of beds. They are located in different places around the state now. So we have a... Uh, a psychiatric hospital in Berlin that has 25 beds, and the Brattleboro Retreat has an additional 14 beds, and Rutland Regional Medical Center has another six beds, and then the other uh, seven or eight beds are at um, what's called a secure residential facility in Middlesex. So we, we actually have virtually the same number of beds as we had before, but instead of in one location, they're spread out mm -hmm. uh, around the state. And mental health problems have continued to, uh, the number of mental health problems have continued to increase over the years. So we do have backlogs um, of people, and everybody's heard stories about um, mental health patients being stuck in emergency rooms uh, of hospitals all around the state waiting for placement. Um, and so one of the things we're working on is trying to figure out the, the flow of mental health patients and where what kinds of facilities we need based on the kinds of treatment that that people need and and our state hospital is only for people who are being involuntarily committed uh -huh. uh, for testing or competency or things like that um, so uh, that's sort of a very brief overview of it but we're trying to look at the system and see what we need to do and and the other pro the other issue is that um, there are people in our prisons, in our correctional facilities, who require mental health treatment, and they need a place to go to. And the prisons aren't always set up to handle uh, mental health patients. And so we're looking to put in what we call a forensic mental health unit in one of our one or two of our prisons, or at least some beds, so that we can help people who are in prison and have destabilized somehow uh, and need some help for a period of time, but don't need to go to the psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to remove the roadblocks 
so that people can get the help they need when they need it. Mm-hmm. That costs that's very money. Important. It is very important. Yes. It's very important uh, for for all of us. So that's one of the things we've been working on. Um, uh, also in the corrections area, we've been looking at um, opioid treatment for people within correctional facilities. Uh, in the last few months, the Department of Corrections has expanded their ability to treat people who have um, substance uh, problems uh, so that they can continue to get medication. Medi- we call it medically assisted treatment for, these, for opioid uh, disorder. And uh, now every correctional facility in the state, you can, uh, uh, an inmate or offender can get 120 days of treatment. Before we had two or three facilities that offered 90 days, but the rest of the facilities didn't offer any treatment. And if you're coming off um, drugs it's, and detoxing, it's a very painful experience. So, of course, they don't give drugs in... <laughs> well, they are now, I mean, in, in special areas, that's right. So they're giving medically assisted treatment to help, and so that's been helpful. But it's medical. Yes, it's assisted, medically assisted treatment. As opposed to dr- drugs. Right, exactly. But people who come in on a medically assisted treatment plan can continue to get help when they're in a correctional facility, and that didn't used to be the case. Yeah. So yeah. that's a good thing. The, the other thing that we get asked about a lot is how can we reduce our prison population? We actually have one of the lowest prison populations per capita in the country. Uh, and, and because of policies that the legislature enacted starting in 2008, we've dramatically reduced the number of people that are housed in correctional facilities. Um, a, a few years ago, it was projected that we'd have over 2,800 prisoners or inmates. We're down to 1,700. And of those 1,700, at any given time, about 350 to 400 are what we call detainees, who are people that have been charged but not sentenced. So they're awaiting trial or awaiting something. And, and so we often hear, can't we just get those people through the system? What, what can we do about that? So we actually had a, a part of our testimony last week was to talk about who is this population of detainees? What are they in for? What's happening? So they took a day, because that's all you can do, it changes day to day. They took a day in early, earlier in February, like about a, a week ago, and there were 359 detainees, of which 200 are held without bail. So we're not gonna just put them on home detention if they're put on, if they're held without bail, because usually if you're held without bail, it's because it's a more serious crime. So 56% of our detainees are held without bail. So then we said, well, what are they in? What are they being charged with, even if they haven't been sentenced? 20% of those are charged with aggravated domestic assault. So that, uh. we're, we can't put them on home detention because putting them back in the home, if they're charged with aggravated domestic assault, that doesn't work. Because no. the victim is probably at that home. Uh, murder in the second degree is the next highest one. Sexual assault, aggravated domestic violence uh, slightly less uh, severe. There's sort of seven very serious crimes that account for 50% of our detainees that are held without bail. So we can't put them on home detention and release them from our correctional facilities. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would beat up somebody in the home. They might. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, it's a much higher risk of more bad things happening. Yeah. So there's a reason that we have held without bail. <laughs> and those are the reasons. So we're, we're continuing to look at where we can put people on home detention with electronic monitoring. Um, we have to be sure that the state's attorneys are willing to do it because the court has to order electronic monitoring in the home. And we created some legislation last year around that, hoping that we'd get up to at least 50 de- detainees. We've only had, we've had generally had about two or three well, they've reached a high of 12 detainees, but we aren't anywhere near the 50. Yeah. So and that's why we wanted to and see. And these DNT, DNTs. Detainees. Detainees. Um, uh, they, they can go other places? Or if, there's a, if there's a, electronic I mean, monitoring is, you know, they put something on your hand or yeah. your ankle and you're, you're monitored real time all the time and you have to be in a certain place. So you have to be in a home or a living situation that's appropriate for you yes. and whatever the crime yeah. was. So it, and the court then has to order it. So there's a lot of crimes for which being in a home is not appropriate, like domestic assault. So, yeah. 
Uh, by ch of children or of, of, of the spouse. Anybody. The spouse right. And so you can't put them back in the home. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges that we yeah. have there. So that's one area that we work on. And, and then the other area that we spend a lot of time on um, is related to uh, the capital budget, money that we bond. And a lot of that has been related to things such as, the cl as clean water the whole Clean Water Act and the issue we have with Lake mm -hmm. Champlain and our, you know, 94% of our lakes and streams and waterways um, are polluted to some degree or another. And so cleaning up our been, water. We, we've been working on that for years. We're working yes. on it when I was in yes. the legislature. And in 2015, when you were in the legislature, they passed Act, I think it was one, either 64 or 164, which is the Clean Water Act. Yeah. Uh, which said that these things had to be done, and the EPA, the federal EPA, has come after Vermont and said you have to you have to do these things. So we are we're working on that, and a lot of it, we we use money from the capital budget to pay for various programs. So we work with the Agency of Agriculture and the Agency of Natural Resources yes. um, to uh, to fund things like ecosystem restoration grants and riparian buffer zones between fields and streams to protect to keep phosphorus and and other uh, things going into our into our waterways so it, it means a lot of change for farmers it means a lot of change for municipalities uh, you know because stormwater and uh, runoff and impervious surfaces like roads and that water goes into our waterways um, and then harms the fish it can harm the fish but it, uh, you uh, see the big algae blooms that have yeah. happened you know this last summer the, the one that it, it was most on people's minds was Lake Carmi um, in Franklin County, so a little inland. Um, but they had water blo algae blooms. The whole lake turned green over uh -huh. the summer. And, and we actually had somebody come in and talk to us for a couple of hours about Lake Carmi last week. And a lot of it has to do with climate change and our changing weather patterns. And for the first time ever, they've had phosphorus in the sediment at the bottom of the lake for a long time. But because of the way the heating and cooling happened last summer and over the fall, combined with different kinds of heavy rains, it brought all the phosphorus up from the surface. The, the, um, the water became anaerobic, had no oxygen at the lower levels. Uh, and then things got stirred up, and that created the algae blooms. And so all these people who'd been swimming in it for previous years had never had this problem. And suddenly this year, we had these huge algae blooms. So we were wow. meeting with people yeah. to put in some kind of an aeration system in the lake. And we were talking about that last week, which would be like a long tube or pipe of some kind with holes in it that would aerate the lake and keep it more fresh and hopefully reduce that. Apparently that's worked in some other states. We're trying to find out a little bit more about it. But mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, there's a lot more technology now, but these problems, as you know, didn't happen yes. overnight. People have been farming for hundreds yes. of years. Yes. Um, so and all that phosphorus has been settling in, right. the, in the lake. Exactly. So when it gets stirred up, then it creates all these problems. So mm -hmm. how do we get rid of it? How do we get rid of what we have, but how do we prevent any more phosphorus from entering the lake? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, we discussed that when I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be talked about for a long time and it's a it's a bit of a challenge because the legislature asked the Agency of Natural Resources they they put together a committee to say where are we going to get some of the funding from and they came back and said, "Oh, we don't need any more funding right now." Which is not true. We need, you know, we yeah. have we need like 1.2 billion dollars over 20 years and they said, "We're fine with what we're trying to do these little amounts right now and we'll need a lot more later, so we're not going to worry about it," which is not Well, not how we think yeah. it should be. <laughs> it should be more. It, we need more. More, more. Uh, yeah. To do more. Right, exactly. Now. Yeah. 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 Because it only gets worse if you just don't take care of it. Right, right. We need to change behaviors. Uh, and so, you know, that's why we're looking at how we can improve the soil. I think when you, Amy will come and talk to you about regenerative agriculture and improving the soils, which means not needing so much phosphorus. We're also looking at, um, you know, there are places that have aerobic digesters uh, and then they use some of the, so they take the manure and 
uh, you know, use it for heat and then they have, they can use some of the solids and end up making bedding for their cows and things like that. But I think we're going to have to look at big changes. And mm -hmm. we've already started that with required agricultural practices that uh, farmers are having to pay attention to now. So mm -hmm. there's certainly a, a lot of changes uh, underway. And they got to be helped or they'll go out of business. Right. And that's what a lot of our grants are for, is to help, is to help farmers with getting new equipment or new farming practices uh, so that they can, um, they can farm in a way that's good for them, but also good for the health of our soil and our lakes and mm -hmm. our waterways. Because that's really important. If we don't have clean water, yeah. you know, yeah. for drinking and everything else, yeah. recreation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Washing it's, dishes. <laughs> it's pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, we've spent a lot of time on that. Um, some of the other things that we do, we, we heard from um, the police and fire, uh, state police and state fire academies they're, they're, that are down in Pittsford, just south of us on Route 7, the, where they do the police training. They also do fire training there. Um, and uh, we're going to help fund what's called a burn building. The firefighters come in and they practice on a, on a building. Um, practice putting out fires on a building. And it's a building you can use many times, as it turns out, because you use sort of fake fire and smoke, and I don't know all the technical details. Well, when, when we did it, uh, we actually burned a building that was going to be torn down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a real building. Yes. And uh, we practiced on that. Right. But it was something that nobody wanted, and it was right. useless. Right. And I think there's still a lot of that going on. And, but for training purposes, this is a specially constructed building that's three stories and has outside stairs and inside stairs and windows. And so they get to try to test uh -huh. a lot of different situations yeah. in, one, in one event, which is kind of cool. It turns out the, the uh, police and fire academy have been, uh, they're used all the time. They just do so much training that they don't actually have enough space to keep people overnight. Because some of the training could be 12 weeks long. Uh, and so they're going to uh, renovate one of the buildings that are there and make it into some dorm rooms so that, that more people can stay so that we can get better training for folks. Oh, good. So that's a good yeah. thing. So yeah. <laughs> we just never know what we're going to be talking about. Oh, and then last week we had a conversation about drones. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And this may end up in your old committee and judiciary committee. I don't know. I think it will. Um, we, our committee created a bill about uh, no fly zones over correctional facilities for drones that that any drones because people are using drones to uh, smuggle drugs in oh. and other things yeah and so they are going to have a no fly zone so it has to be at least 500 feet away from the perimeter of a prison they can't come closer than 500 feet and they can't be closer than 400 feet above the top of the prison <laughs> and you can't get any higher because then you're getting into FAA airplane regulations. So, uh -huh. um, so is it? I was wondering why the 400, but then yeah, that's good explanation. Right. So, who would have thought we'd be having drone regulations and prisons? I mean, it's just a fascinating. What do know. many people really use drones? Uh, apparently so. Mm -hmm. Apparently so. I don't know how if it's that. It's, I don't know how much of a problem it's been in Vermont, but it has been around the country. Mm -hmm. So it's better to get on top of it while you can. Always better to do that. Yes, yes. We always so. try to do that. that. <laughs> so it's been uh, it's been pretty interesting. Um, oh, and one of the other things that we have been talking about, we had a request. Um, there are the um, restorative justice centers around the state that, that try to help, um, help people either when they've come out of prison or before they even go in. Uh, instead of, it's, we also have court diversion yeah. to keep people from coming in, but there's a whole restorative justice piece. And, and they have asked us, the, Nash, the, the State Network for Domestic and Sexual Violence, have asked if they could um, put together a group of people to do a study to look at using restorative justice as a way of helping people who are domestic violence perpetrators. Um, instead of just sending them to prison, can we actually do something that will help 
change their behavior mm -hmm. over the long run, which is hard to do. And I thought, boy, that's a great um, thought to try to see if this could work, to do a study on that and, and a creative solution instead of just saying, put them in jail. Is there a way that we can really help people make permanent change in their lives? Yeah. Um, it's a study that won't cost anything because, uh, it, I know, isn't that great? <laughs> So we're looking at, at uh, approving that to, to do something. And I, it's nice when people think about creative ways to, uh, to help, a, help other people. How come it won't cost anything? Well, because the, the state network for domestic and sexual violence will run it, will organize it. They'll call the meetings. They'll take all the notes. They'll put the report together. So, uh, so we won't need, uh, there will not be legislators on the, the study committee. There will be a number of other people. But we'll get the report and we'll get the information. And if we act on it, there may be some cost to things. We mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like a great idea to explore that further. Yeah, because you need people to do this right. for other people. Right. And so they have to be paid. Well, the, the groups, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not legislator groups. So, you know, when we're on a committee, we get paid a per diem when, when legislators are put on a committee, but this isn't going to. This is not asking for legislators to be on the committee. Mm -hmm. It's just asking us to to sort of authorize the study to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be very interesting. So yeah. in a year, I could be back talking to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the uh, report that I briefly mentioned uh, from the Secretary of Human Services also included a 925 bed prison. You've probably read about that in the paper. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no money in the budget to do that, either now or down the road. But it's something that uh, was proposed. And it isn't new beds, but what it does is cl the proposal wants to close the women's facility in South Burlington and the men's facility up in St. Albans and build a larger campus up in St. Albans where we already own some property. And one of the things is to would be to bring back our prisoners that are out of state. Yeah, that's important. That is. And that's something that we all agree on, that bringing back our out of state uh, prisoners would be a very good thing. We don't have space for them right now with what we have. And the governor insisted on closing our Windsor facility last year. So we're still looking at whether we could do something there. But there's about 250, and so you know, that would be one way of, of dealing with how we're getting people back from out of state. So, so our committee is looking at that and what that means. The governor didn't put any money in the budget, in his budget for this, this year. So uh, we won't be making any decisions I, I know right away. I know uh, having people come back mm -hmm. um, from prisons in other states. Uh, sometimes they aren't treated, dif they're treated differently. Right. Here we try to teach them how to come out and have a job and, and work and, and stuff there. They teach them how to crime. Right. How to commit more crimes. Right, right. And some of them. Yeah. A and uh, I don't know which ones, but I've heard that some of them. Yes. Well, I know there's been a lot of challenges. I just read something in the paper today about another uh, inmate who was having a problem. At, we, we had to move our prisoners last year from where they were in Michigan to Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, in Michigan, it was a for-profit prison, which usually isn't a very good thing, except the Vermonters were the only people in the prison. So uh, there, were no other, uh, there were no other prisoners from Michigan. It was, it was an empty prison except for our little wing of 250 prisoners. And so that, they, they were, we didn't have that many complaints from that area because they weren't intermingled and they used our, our rules and our laws. They've moved to Pennsylvania and it's, instead of a contract, it's an interstate compact. And so Vermont and Pennsylvania and a bunch of other states are part of this interstate compact. And so you abide by the rules of the compact. So we don't have the same kind of control over what happens as we do when it's when we have a contract and that's been very frustrating for a lot of people mm -hmm. um, and it has not been an easy transition there's been a lot of bad press about it and our our folks aren't so happy and the reason that we were had to leave the for-profit prison was with a new administration in washington 
They figured that federal immigration would be rounding up more people and they'd be putting them in these prisons and they wanted room for them. Oh, oh well. Yes. That's not too good. That's not so good. That's not uh, so we so have about two or three minutes left. Is there yeah. something in particular that you wanted to uh, have the public know? Check my notes. Well, yeah, so I, I think what I'd like people to know is that the Vermont General Assembly website is a great place for people to find out what's happening at the State House. What happens at the State House, the State House is the people's house. You are all welcome to come and visit any time. If you want to know what's happening, go to the Vermont General Assembly website. You can look up all the committees for the House and the Senate. You can find out who your legislators are. You know who they are here. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to find out about other people's, and then you can go to a, you can click on a committee and find out what the agenda is for the week. If you want to find documents um, for what's happening. So I printed off some information about detainees that I was talking to. Mm -hmm. That's available to the public. They can go on the website and print this out. If people want to follow a bill, they can go on the website and find out about that. Uh, it Does also it come by topic or by number or both? Comes by both. So uh, any number of ways you can find you can find out this information. Uh, and I'm thrilled that people in Middlebury tend to be pretty engaged. I get a fair number of emails about different things, and I, and it's great. I like to know that um, people in Middlebury are paying attention. And you know, so if you have any questions, you can email me at any time. Our legislative email addresses are on the website. If people want to come up to the State House and let us know that they're coming up, we're happy to have lunch with people or introduce them. Um, I've had some people call saying, I could be a really helpful resource about this particular item. And that's great for me to know that I can call on them and say, give me your opinion about this thing that we're talking about. So, yeah. uh, it's very accessible. That's what I really want to say, yeah. is that you can get a lot of information, and people are very willing to talk to you and, and uh, help you find out the get the information you need. Mm -hmm. I often go to, a lot of people are interested in things around fish and wildlife and water quality. And so I'm, I'm often talking to the chair of that committee and saying, what's happening with this bill? Because people yeah. here are interested. Yeah, so yeah that, that's part of your job. It is. Yeah. So be in touch. It's well, great. Thank you for coming. Okay. And, uh, thank you, Betty. Talk. Yeah, okay. thanks for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>